Since 1978, 14 bombings have occurred across our nation. They have targeted professors and individuals associated with airlines or aircraft production. In 17 years, he's killed three people with his homemade mail bombs and left many others horribly maimed. Thus, we've developed the code name Unabomber to refer to the bomber and Unibom to refer to the investigation. The threat came by letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, warning that a bomb would be put in an airliner out of Los Angeles within the next six days. Further examination has confirmed that this letter originates uh, from the Unabomber subject. People around town were surprised to hear about the Unabomber suspect living in their small rural community. There's other people I would have thought were, you know, if they're going to pick somebody in Lincoln, Montana, I'd have thought, not him. In Lincoln, Kaczynski didn't stand out. You know, we have people in Lincoln with long beards and long hair and all that kind of stuff, and so he didn't, wasn't necessary that he'd fit in. It was just that we have those kinds of people up here, and that's fine. Some are looking at the attention in a positive light, but hope it's short-lived. It's been 25 years since this tiny Montana town became the most famous place in America. Very few events in history require just a one word description, but say Unabomber, and most can tell you exactly where they were when they learned that one of the longest manhunts in FBI history had come to an end. Ted Kaczynski went from a former unknown college professor to a household name, one known more and more to generations now through documentaries and original series. But you likely haven't heard this version, how the biggest story in the world came to MTN's doorstep, putting our journalists shoulder to shoulder with every major network in America, and how one family connection discovered years later brought us back here to tell you the truth about one of Lincoln's local heroes. You're entering hallowed ground here, Casey. <laughs> this is it. There's the old desk. I would uh, saunter in, yeah, just like that. And this is the exact desk. That is the desk. Uh, let's just start with when you started here at KXR. Which time? <laughs> I interned here in college in okay. 1974. I was just telling you about working here in the summer. I originally wanted to go into production, but uh, the news director came and said, we got two, two interns, one of them's going to the news department, so you come with me. The purpose of this display is to see if the use of energy can be controlled by switches. I uh, went and became the Capitol Bureau Chief for Color 8. Uh, believe it or not, Color 8's office and the MTN office, we shared an office, and so they cherry-picked me and hired me away uh, when they had an opening, and that's when I moved to MTN, 1983, so you do the math. I wonder where they got these old photos. Jay Cohn is a Montana television legend. You can split his 40-year career into two parts. For the first 20, he was a jack of all trades, sports director, news director, Capitol Bureau chief, all between Helena and Butte. So far, so good, Julie. You then, in 1998, the, uh, he became the face of KTVQ in Billings. In Washington, with our chief photographer, Paul Humphrey, I'm Jay Cohn. Anchoring thousands of broadcasts until his semi-retirement and transition to anchor emeritus two and a half years ago. He's never short on stories, but there's one that stands above the rest. A convoy of law enforcement officers haul fugitive Freeman to jail cells in Billings. On March 25, 1996, after the FBI captured Montana Freeman leader Leroy Schweitzer, 
Ten of his fellow militiamen barricaded themselves in a compound on a ranch just outside Jordan, Montana, beginning an 81-day standoff with federal agents. The FBI, coming off two similar incidents the previous two years in Ruby Ridge, Idaho and Waco, Texas, that resulted in 83 deaths, were reluctant to treat this situation with the same force. They call themselves the, quote, freemen. They don't obey laws. That created a made-for-TV atmosphere that brought every national news outlet to the treasure state. Hundreds of federal peace officers and police are laying siege to a heavily armed compound in Montana. KXLF here in Butte had the uplink for CBS. So the network had called and said, we want to make sure there's an engineer there, the uplink is operating, we want to reserve it for tomorrow. And that was the only thing I could think why CBS would be interested that day. How are you today, ma'am? That call came in on April 2nd, a day before CBS knew one of the biggest stories in the country would break, because they already had the story. A source had confirmed to reporter Jim Stewart that authorities were closing in on their top suspect in a 17-year-long case, with a raid on the man's small Montana cabin imminent. But before veteran anchor Dan Rather could deliver that news on the 3rd, CBS needed one more piece of information. You know, the idiom in, in news is like we need three independent confirmation for every little piece of information, especially when you're on a manhunt like that. Well, I got a phone call, I would say maybe early afternoon here, and it was from the CBS News Washington Bureau, and they said, we're looking to find out if this individual ever had a Montana driver's license, and if so, we'd like a picture of it. So I immediately called our Capitol Bureau chief and said, Paul, do you know anybody at the DMV? I'm wondering if that you can call up and find real quick if this guy ever had a driver's license. They were able to confirm that he had a driver's license, gave me the, his address, which I believe was a post office box, but the birth date is what was key. And so I called the Washington desk back and said, here's the date on it and his birthday. And the guy went, that's exactly what we needed. Thank you so much and hung up. I went, cool. I had no idea what, it, what, what that was connected to. Dan Rather reporting from CBS News World Headquarters in New York. Good afternoon. There was a TV on in the newsroom. CBS News breaking into programming with a special report. There has been a major break in the case of the so-called Unabomber. This is Dan Rather. The Unabomber suspect has been arrested in Lincoln, Montana. And they put his name up there and I, my jaw just went... <laughs> now I know what that phone call was about, but I, I, I was just stunned. I ran home for lunch in between class and turned on the TV. Peter Jennings broke in that they had found the Unabomber in Montana. I was like, what? And so then I immediately called into the station and, you know, what, what's going on? What are we doing? And then I don't even think I ate lunch. I just packed up and, and ran to work after that. James Rafferty was destined for that day. I wanted to be in journalism from a young age. Basically, when I was in fifth grade, I tried to start a newspaper at my elementary school and was shot down by the principal because apparently the First Amendment doesn't exist in elementary school. But I'd had an interest in it ever, from, from that day, John. Rafferty had been with MTN for seven years by April of 96, but as a part-time weekend photographer at KPAX in Missoula, was still a low man on the totem pole. But he had two things going for him. One, he grew up in Great Falls and had traveled to and from college dozens of times through Lincoln. Anybody that makes that drive, that's, that's where you stop. You stop in Lincoln to get a snack, probably go to the bathroom, and that's your, that's your midway point, and then you make your way to Missoula or Great Falls from that. And two, his brashness wasn't going to let him take no for an answer, uncovering the biggest story of his lifetime. I mean, I basically got to the newsroom, and it was our weekend reporter, Rebecca, and you know, they were going to send her by herself, and I kind of made the argument of this is kind of a big story, that, you know, if we have to pay the part-time weekend kid to go along, it might be worth the four twenty-five an hour. And so we tossed the gear in and hopped in the car and honestly didn't really know what to expect. You know, it was just go to Lincoln and try to figure out what's going on. Keep in mind, too, this is 1996. We didn't, have a, we didn't have a smartphone. We couldn't Google things on the way or get push alerts, you know. The first stop was the convenience store because that's kind of where everybody congregates in Lincoln and asked a few questions like, hey, you know, so we heard that they caught the Unabomber. You know, any idea where that might be? Well, I saw a bunch of people heading down this road, so we 
went down that road and saw police tape along the entrance for one road and it was kind of a no-brainer that that was where he would be. Media staked out this spot near Kaczynski's cabin all day. The suspect apparently lives up this road, but FBI agents won't let anyone through and will make no comment. What is your thought about how to cover this story? Are you turning on the camera and just saying, I just need to roll? Just roll on everything. Roll on everything that moves. You know, roll on the media that has converged upon that, because at some point that's going to be a story. And then a, a white Bronco came down and they pulled the tape out and I kind of started to zoom in on the back seat and there was just this wild hair. And it was like, okay, that person is not law enforcement, probably not an FBI agent. So just kind of zoomed in as tight as I could on him and then followed the Bronco down the street. And then, I mean, we all knew that that's who it was. So then everybody just packed up and, and made a beeline back into Lincoln to figure out what our next move was. Well, we knew he was gonna appear in court the next day and somebody needed to go get him in court. But we also needed to get all of that footage back to get on our 10 o'clock news that night for the entire state. So what we did is we split up. I gave all of my tapes to the KRTV crew. They took off for Great Falls. Rebecca and I then took the Lincoln Road to Helena and found a place to crash and crash for the night. In that hotel room, Rafferty barely had time to process that he had just been on the front lines of history. At that point, the only people who had laid eyes on Ted Kaczynski were the handful of journalists on that road, the FBI agents who had finally captured the domestic terrorists they'd come to call the Unabomber, and a local Forest Service ranger named Jerry Burns, who kept one of the biggest secrets in the world from just about everybody who knew him. My dad, later on, I don't even know how many years later, said, you should go interview your cousin, because he has quite the story on the Unabomber, and I think he's the first one that told me about that. I never really connected the dots. I had no idea that the guy that they used from the Forest Service to help get the drop on Kaczynski was my long-lost cousin from Lincoln. Burns has lived in Lincoln nearly all his life and always had his eyes set on protecting its surroundings. After college and a year fighting in Vietnam, Burns came back to join the Forest Service, originally starting on a trail crew, but eventually moving to the law enforcement side. I went to the academy down there in Glencoe, Georgia, and everything, and came out a law enforcement officer at that time. Yeah. And then I was part-time law enforcement in part-time in the backcountry, so, yeah. That background led Burns to meet a number of Montana Special Projects officers, including members of the state's FBI team, and was the reason his name was at the top of the list of local contacts when the Bureau descended on his town. Agents had zeroed in on Kaczynski as their number one target weeks before the April 3rd raid, but needed a quiet place to plan. That place turned out to be the Burns' living room. Yeah, they would come in the evenings and meet with Jerry, yeah. What was that like for you? What oh, it was so funny because I, you know, they didn't know what to do with me, you know, I was just kind of on the side, and so I'd say hello, and then I'd kind of try to hide in the back of the house. We had a lot of meetings down at the house here, and Laura went in the back room. Burns didn't know it yet, but he would become the key to the entire operation. The FBI needed a local who knew the land well, because Kaczynski knew it better than every agent. Officers knew Kaczynski had constructed numerous hideouts surrounding his property five miles south of town in this thick, wooded area, so they needed to approach when he was inside the cabin. But that also presented challenges. For one, they didn't have an arrest warrant. 
just a search warrant that finally came through the morning of the 3rd. That gave the FBI the green light. But at the pre-raid meeting, Burns made a call that changed the entire story. If we're going to surround the cabin and uh, bring them out that way, and I said, no, I, I said, uh, I think the best bet is to uh, us three go up there as a survey team. Jerry said, you know, it's April, the snow's crunchy, and he's going to hear you a mile away because he's been living up there in isolation. So the best way is to approach him directly and talk to him about his property line. Of course, it's one thing to come up with the plan. Now, Burns had to execute it as the one luring the Unabomber, a man who had killed three people and injured 23 others, out of his cabin in the woods. The agreement of, for the three of them that were on the arresting team was that he would never go back in. Max Knowles and, and Tom McDaniels and I walked up to the cabin and I knocked on the door and said, Ted, are you home? And he opened up the door and uh, I grabbed his hands and uh, out, out the door he came, so. Jerry said his hand was, was up on the side of the door and Ted went back, started to go back in, he said to get his slippers, and Jerry just took his wrist and he went out horizontal and Jerry said he was so full of adrenaline at that moment that he just came out horizontally. <laughs> and um, he was the one that cuffed him and he said uh, Ted started to struggle and he said, Ted, um, you be a gentleman and we'll be gentlemen also. And he said all the soup just ran out of him and he just collapsed. Tom McDaniel put him in a uh, chokehold and I put the cuffs on him and uh, Max Noel said, we got a warrant for your cabin and everything. So, and, and they come down to another cabin that was down there and, and that was the last I seen of Ted, yeah. We got up and we made sure we were here at the, at, at that time was the federal courthouse to get his arrival at court. <laughs> and once we got here, it was a zoo. Um, this entire parking lot was full of, you know, media from all over the place. I was very naive at the time that we were in a single line, so Everybody's got their, their shot and he'll come past me and I'll, I'll pan along and, and get him going up the steps and everything will be nice and orderly. Well, he took two steps and that single line went, in, went from a line to a mob. And so to be honest, I kind of was outside the, the pack. And then I was like, you know what? You've been waiting eight years for this. You're not gonna, you're not gonna just be shut out and have like a whole bunch of people's backs. How did you do it? How did you do it? At that time, the larger media had what's called beta cams. So everybody had these smaller, you know, shoulder mount cameras. I still had the small market giant three quarter inch deck and big cameras. So I kind of used that to my advantage and just kind of started to swing that deck around and knocked a couple of people out of my way. And then kind of found a gap right behind them. And just, I was probably about 40 or 50 pounds lighter at the time. So I just kind of slid right in there and then just followed them. Are you the Unabomber? It was kind of being in the right place at the right time as far as being able to get the right shot along with our network to get a good sequence of what's happening. But then also, you know, camera, camera operators don't usually end up on camera. So you never, you're like, oh yeah, I, I, I was there for that event and I was behind the scenes. You rarely ever see yourself. Well, now every time there's a documentary on the Unabomber and they get the footage from CBS, I, I'm like, okay, three, two, yep, there I am. In his first court appearance, 53-year-old Theodore Kaczynski spoke softly but clearly, telling the judge he cannot afford his own attorney. At that time, we had a bureau in the basement of the Capitol, so we were able to then work out of there and, and feed all of our stuff from there. Officials admit this hearing is a holding action. You can't have cameras in federal court, so you have to do court sketches. And again, you couldn't just scan the court sketches and, and send them. You had to shoot them with a camera. So they came racing down into the basement of the Capitol with, you know, three or four sketches of like, how do we get these to New York in 20 minutes? So we put them on a music stand and fired up my camera and hooked it up to the outgoing signal from Helena, got New York on the phone, they had a satellite, and we basically were just shooting all the court sketches for CBS TV News that night. And they turned them around like 15 minutes later and, and that was Rather's lead that night. Have you ever felt more pressure 
reporting a story? Maybe when the, the Unabomber's cabin came through on the, on the back of the, the semi-truck, got calls from every station, every network, you know, you can't miss it, we need it. It was like, I was going, for the love of God. My name is Shannon Everts, and I worked at KRTV for about 13 years. Hello, and welcome to Wild Montana. I'm Jay Cohn. And I'm Shannon Everts. And at the time of the Unabomber story, I was the news anchor for the 5.30 and 10 o'clock news. Is James Rafferty, who has been the newscast director for the past three years. Federal agents basically lifted up his cabin and took it to Malmstrom Air Force Base and they stored it at Malmstrom for a year. Then a year later, it's like three in the morning, I get a phone call at my house. And he says, Shannon, get your camera, get to Malmstrom Air Force Base, the front gate, they're gonna be moving the Unabomber cabin. We sat in, at the front gate, it was freezing cold, waiting. And we're like waiting and waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden, here comes this huge semi with a flatbed. And the Unabomber cabin is draped in a green tarp. And it's laying on the flatbed. And it comes out of Malmstrom Air Force Base. And so I'm getting this footage. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, CBS. News doesn't even know this is happening. Nobody knows this is happening. And it rolls past me, I get the footage, and then I throw everything in my car and I go up to 10th Avenue South. And I park on the side of 10th Avenue South and I set up my gear and I'm just scrambling. And I get all set up and the sun is coming up and the truck is coming down 10th Avenue South with the Unabomber cabin on the back with this unbelievable sunrise. And I get this shot and I'm just so excited and I throw everything in the car and I scream up to KRTV and I go back to the back room and I'm like, get viewed on the phone, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna send this video to CBS News for their morning show. And we did, we linked up and they had it live and they were the first ones to have that footage. And then Dan Rather that night, he opened his whole newscast with the footage of the truck going down 10th Avenue South with the Unabomber cabin on the back. As jury selection was rolling along today for the Unabomber trial of Ted Kaczynski, so was a key piece of defense evidence. And it was quite a sight. For it to be the opening shot for Dan Rather was incredible. When you look back at it, do you think MTN did the story justice? Were you proud to work for MTN? Oh yeah. It was uh, the benefit of having a group of stations as opposed to just one lone newsroom trying to cover it. We were able to team up with our Great Falls people. I think MTN just killed it on this story. I really do. I mean, when you have a station um, in every market in Montana, you can rely on everybody who might have information from Helena or Missoula and have the resources to send a crew to um, be able to get that footage, share it with the whole state, so the whole state gets to see Ted Kaczynski at the same time, which was pretty phenomenal. For years, people have asked, why Lincoln? Why did Ted Kaczynski choose this tiny, isolated town in the middle of the mountains to run a nationwide terror campaign? We'll likely never know what brought him to this specific spot, but he wasn't the first to put Montana on the map, and he won't be the last. Everything has a Montana connection to it. And I mean, we'd always say, oh yeah, that guy that uh, got arrested in DC for doing this, he's, he'll be from Montana. I, you know, there's always seems to be a Montana connection. And this may have been the story that started all that. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, for sure. The guy they've been searching for for 17 years is holed up in a cabin outside of Lincoln. We're still talking about it 25 years later. There's a national fascination with it that really hasn't gone away in 25 years. And every time that story is told, it comes back to, they found him in a cabin in Lincoln, Montana. And then the story goes from there, but it always comes back to Montana. Jerry knows that feeling. He retired from the Forest Service in March of 2003, but he and Laura still live in the same home, just on the edge of town. 
They don't talk about April 3rd, 1996 much, mostly just pulling this box of memories out from the back of the closet whenever company comes over and inevitably asks. One particular highlight, a note from FBI agent Tom McDaniel that he called a tribute to Jerry Burns. Others had to sing his praises because Jerry was never one to brag. I mean, do you feel proud about what you've done? Do you, do you feel proud of your work and, and that being involved in this? Right, yeah, I, I do, yeah. Just another day at the job. <laughs> you know, since then, I've realized, you know, how many people were injured and died and how many people's careers, their entire careers put into this investigation. I mean, how big it was. And then here it comes down to this my husband walking up to a cabin, you know, in Lincoln and actually grabbing the Unabomber. It's amazing. Not everyone is given the opportunity to show, you know, how they really are in a situation. And he's numerous times been given these situations that you could fail or you could succeed. And he has succeeded every time. So, I know I'm very proud of him. <laughs> kind of makes me emotional. <laughs> this is quite uh, an intellectual serial killer. The most intellectual serial killer the nation has ever produced. The presence of the FBI and the attention from numerous media have caught the people of Lincoln off guard. They say it's hard to imagine the Unabomber living here.